Just be a moment. All right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, it is the first Tuesday of the month, which means it's time for Straight Talk with Dr. Doug Lyle. He answers your questions if you submit them in advance. How do you do that? Just go to chefaj.com, subscribe to my newsletter, and once a week, usually on a Sunday, we send you out the schedule of the guests for the week. You just respond to it with your question. Keep it short one per person. And if you want it anonymous, put it at the beginning. Don't wait till I read the whole thing and then your name and then say, by the way, this is anonymous. All right. Please welcome Dr. Doug Lyle. How's it going, Dr. Lyle? Good, AJ. Good to see you. Yeah. Do you ever get tired of answering questions? And so, because sometimes it's the same question and sometimes it's a variation of the same question. Yeah. I, I would say once in a while you, you get tired of answering what you think is exactly the same question, but, but uh, my, uh, my, uh, answering questions tickles my teaching gene, of which I've got a big one. And so I can usually, I can usually answer questions. I could literally answer questions for probably eight hours straight. Let's do it. Do you remember the play Nicholas Nickleby that a actor Roger Reese won? I forget the award you get for plays. I used to, I used to be this dog walker. He passed away. He was on the show Cheers. There was yeah. some play that was like, I don't know, it was like 24 hours long or something like that. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's do a dugathon one day. I would, I will sit, I bet you will get a lot of views. I'm very, very serious. People would love it because we have so many questions going all the way back to October. We can get them all done. So if you're game, I'm game. Let's do it. All right. Um, well, that sounds like, that, that sounds good, like an entertaining thing. We okay. could even charge a little bit for it. I mean, you're worth it. Audience, would you like to have a dugathon eight hours straight of Dr. Lyle? I know I would. What's interesting, Dr. Lyle, and I mean this sincerely, is especially like when you're talking about nutrition or health or weight loss, because I've interviewed you a lot. Even though you get the same question, I often hear you say it slightly different way. And then I write down one sentence. I never heard him say that. And I always learn something new, even from the same question. All good. All right. Which brings me to the same question mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot or a variation, but, but people really are worried about this. Uh, Claudine says, Dr. Lyle, you have previously explained that if one eats a wet starch-based whole food diet consistent with our natural environment, it will be easy to maintain a healthy weight since the natural satiety mechanisms are self-regulating such that if one overeats one day, one will compensate the next or the following. My question is how much of an issue is recreational eating? I'm not talking about eating non-compliant food, but rather for reaching for whole natural food like fruit out of boredom rather than hunger. How damaging is that kind of behavior to maintaining a healthy weight if one sticks to an A-plus diet of wet starches three times a day plus steamed vegetables, salads, and fruits? And I'm wondering, do other species eat out of boredom? Um, yeah, what, what you recognize as boredom is actually, uh, you, so you're thinking, hey, this is just sort of extra or ancillary eating that I don't have to be doing because I'm not particularly hungry. But let's actually talk about what's uh, more accurately about what's happening. So uh, I remember Jim Jim Lennon. Uh, I don't know if you've ever met Jim, uh, AJ. I love him. I yeah. he's wonderful. Yeah. Jim, Jim always would uh, uh, yank my chain. He'd say, uh, "Doug, what you really need to learn to do is answer the question first, and then you can go into your explanation." Is you have a half. <laughs> just talking and then saving it for the end. And by that time, everybody's lost. So the, the beginning answer to the question is that we don't need to worry about uh, this sort of eating at all. Okay. So now I'll explain why. The, uh, the reason is, is that what you call boredom eating is, uh, is actually uh, much more sophisticated than you think it is. So what your mind is designed to do is it's designed to run um, uh, cost-benefit analysis on alternative courses of action. So you could say, you know what? I, I need to start looking for my car keys. Why? Well, because I'm probably going to go somewhere this afternoon, so I need to do that. But what your mind does is it says, okay, well, we could also go, uh, we could also just continue eating this orange we've got cut up right in front of us. And then it turns out there's a phone call that we probably ought to be making, okay? And then I'm gonna check my cell phone and I'm gonna see if anything interesting just came in on that. And then, so look at what's happening. So the mind is actually making decision after decision after decision after decision. 
as it runs cost benefit analysis on all these alternative courses of action. And so right now, my mind is running all kinds of alternative courses of action about what I'm going to say next. And I, I don't even know what it's going to decide. So the, the all of this is being done unconsciously. In other words, uh, when I say unconsciously, I don't have any awareness. I could not articulate to you the processes that are going on in my unconscious mind. However, what the, what is going on in my unconscious mind is incredibly complicated. Uh, so literally, there are there are a huge number of alternative ideas and sentences that would be constructed to explain those ideas that are that are being generated right now in in my unconscious uh, mind, which is what your mind is. So your consciousness is actually a summary of what's in your unconscious. In other words, it's a little summary mechanism that allows you to actually articulate components of it. So when you say, um, you know, if you sit in a restaurant and you say, I know what I want, I want the such and such. Actually, uh, let's suppose it's a it's the vegan burrito with the rice and the guacamole, okay? But you're gonna order that, but actually what your mind is calculated is it's calculated a whole bunch of little gut uh, taste experiences that you can remember about what that's like. And it would take you quite a while to describe that accurately to another person, and it would still be incomplete. There, there would be flavors in there that you couldn't actually identify, but you are responding to in terms of your preferences. Like you really like it, but you don't actually know what it is, and you don't know if it's a single thing or it's a combination of things. And, and then all the proportions of these different flavors in that vegan burrito actually give rise to that to, to the experience that's positive. And you've, we've all known a situation where, where somebody didn't get it quite right. In other words, they didn't get the recipe quite right. And it's like, you know what? It's pretty much the way I like it, but not quite. It's a little too this or not quite enough that. Um, all right, so what am I uh, saying here? That what your mind is doing is your mind is actually running all kinds of alternative scenarios. It's a simulator and it's running through uh, simulations constantly. It, it seems impossible that it could do this, but it turns out that we now know that the mind is actually running 2 trillion bits of information or actually 2 million bits of data um, per second through the brain, which means that it's uh, many, many times faster of an information processor, possibly a thousand times faster than the fastest supercomputer on earth. So animal brains, uh, and so don't congratulate yourself for being genius. Elephants and dolphins and dogs have a lot of data going through their brains too. So what this means is that, that brains are biologic computers and they have been around for millions of years and they have uh, been uh, their, their natural architecture is one of almost immeasurable complexity. Uh, it, it actually is immeasurable at this point. So, um, so what am I saying here? When you feel bored, what's actually happening, you grab for a peach and you're like, well, I'm not really particularly hungry. So isn't this bored and eating Dr. Lyle and therefore isn't, an, isn't an ancillary and unnecessary? And the answer is, Actually, what boredom is, is a feeling that we use to describe when we don't have any exciting alternative course of action within our awareness. So in other words, we feel like, gee, uh, and, and what excitement is, uh, what excitement is, is it's a, it's a feeling that tells you that you are making a biological profit or that you may make a biological profit. And biological profits are the acquisition of, of uh, resources of some kind, whether it's esteem from other people or it's a drink of water or it's a, it's a bite of an apple or it's a, it's a fuzzy pillow, whatever it is, um, it's, an, it's an asset that evade, uh, aids either survival or reproduction, okay? So that's what, that's what animals and plants do. That's what life does is it actually acts in a way to acquire resources. So animal brains are a specific type of mechanism that allows for an animal to move in ways 
that will help them acquire resources. So when uh, and animals have feelings, when they have uh, evidence uh, of their of their situation in the environment that would cause them to either lose resources, i.e. they feel threatened, uh, they've lost resources, oh, now they feel depressed and demoralized, or they are excited because, oh, it looks like there's some resources for me to get, or they're bored and it says, gee, I don't see a, an efficient way to get a prize resource anywhere in my environment. I don't actually, I can't see any pathway that is efficient that it's gonna give me some big bang for my buck. You're, you're, you are effectively at that moment like a $20 per hand blackjack player that's really good at what you do, but you're caught in some roadside thing, you know, 10, 20 miles outside of Las Vegas, and all they have, you know, they actually have a card game there, but it, but it's two dollars a hand, and you're like, God, it's not even worth playing. I'm bored. Okay, so uh, that's why you know a lot of times wealthy people that like to gamble don't want to gamble for three dollars a hand in a poker game. Uh, where I would, I think it's really exciting. And AJ, by the way, beat Alan. <laughs> <laughs> that's the little at the little uh the chips poker game in, in true that was great was i bad. know i got i got a, i got a free sweatshirt and you know what you have to know how, how proud of this he is of himself about what a great poker player he thinks he is so for you to go in there and i know you don't play nearly as much as he does because he he'll play for hours and hours and hours online so he's extremely experienced and aj went in there and cleaned his clock <laughs> It's just beautiful. So, but uh, so you're when you when you think quote you're bored, um, and I think uh, I I am almost never bored. But uh, when little moments when I'm bored, I now have a little flag that goes off in my head, or if I feel kind of flat, it's like okay, what what you know your your uh, there are prizes out there to work for. There are goals that are worth achieving. And uh, and what's going on here is you are caught in a little dilemma, uh, usually where I'm feeling somehow stuck by something, slightly overwhelmed, maybe a little bit physically tired, some something. And uh, usually what will snap me out of it personally is if I start to clean the house, <laughs> start to make a little bit of progress. And if I start to make a little bit of progress on something, then then I uh, then I then I get ahead of steam and I get more excited about got getting more things done, et cetera. However, this is all a long explanation to try to get it accurate about what, when, when people think, quote, oh, I eat out of boredom. It's like, okay, well, let's see what you really did. What you really did was your brain looked at your environment and it scanned the environment uh, and, and scanned its memory banks for everything possible that it could do in the next two minutes that would be pro potentially profitable or maximally profitable uh, in order to acquire resources for survival and reproduction. You could not think of anything. There's nobody worth phoning, no email worth responding to, no chaise lounge that was cheap on eBay that you had your eye on, you know, it, it, it went up in smoke. So in other words, literally at that moment, you don't have some prize in the environment. There's nothing that's threatening you. There's not a little dog barking running around your house loose. So what what do you do? So remember the two big things in 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 life are survival and reproduction. And food is a number one uh, uh, survival problem. Uh, it is the number one survival problem that in predation. And so if there's no predator around and there's no mate or grandchildren around or children around that that you are trying to for uh, reproductive resources into, then what it turns out, hey, putting some, getting something to eat is literally the best cost benefit uh, analytic decision that my brain can come up with. There you go. So now, now we look at that and it's running a simulation about what the flavor would be like, what it's gonna feel like in digestion, uh, all of that. It's, it's running that whole thing. So when you find yourself eating, quote, out of boredom, yeah, that that's a, uh, all that happened was that your brain calculated 
that that was the most profitable action that you could possibly take with respect to survival and reproductive at that, you know, in that moment in time. That now, now that we see that, we see how extraordinarily important it is to not have junk food in the house because the junk food is a supernormal stimuli that is an evolutionary prize. In other words, you know, your memory systems are going to tell you, wow, I'm going to get a big dopamine hit, which is going to tell my nervous system that I'm much more likely to survive because I just hit a feast. And so feasts would have been periodic things that would happen every week or two or three or four in the stone age. And when they happen, your nervous system is designed to uh, uh, have a great deal of excitement in order to get a hold of that really rich food and to cram it in as far as it'll go, you know, as much as there is, and make sure you get at least your share. So that's why there's a lot of excitement over rich food. But if you're bored and you're eating an apple, uh, I can guarantee you that the reason you're eating that apple isn't quote out of boredom. It's because eating the apple has just enough survival value uh, in that set of circumstances that it's worth doing. And so we wouldn't expect it if you uh, if there wasn't any use for it at all, then you wouldn't eat it. Okay. So if in the, if in your boredom you find yourself eating something that you're not very interested in, we're going to expect that you're not going to eat very much of it uh, if it's not super normal, if it's not very rich. And so you'll nibble at it. Maybe you'll eat a peach, and then you might be thinking, not unreasonably, uh, because everybody in the world thinks that the reason why people are fat is that they overeat. And they don't understand. No, you're not fat because you overeat. You're fat because you eat too many calories. Two different things. And so if you're eating the peach at 300 calories a pound and it's half a pound peach and you ate 150 calories, those calories are perfectly cataloged uh, by the hypothalamus. In other words, that animal on that food will not systematically overeat. Why the hell would it? It would be evolutionarily counterproductive for that thing to systematically overeat any more than you systematically drink too much water or that you systematically would oversleep or that you would systematically overexercise or that you would uh, systematic, systematically have the temperature too high or too low. No, you would not do that. Your, your brain has been very carefully shaped by evolutionary processes to make sure that you would not systematically overeat. That would be an evolutionary error. Okay. Now, however, you're better to overeat temporarily than you are to undereat temporarily, as far as evolution is concerned. So if there's not anything else that you can think of doing, if there's no hangnail that you know how to be fixing, or there's not a flea, flea bite that you should be scratching, and there's no threat anywhere, and there's no profit anywhere, and all there is is some peaches sitting on the counter, and they smell pretty good, and you're not hungry, and you eat one of them, this will not be a systematic overeat. All that's going to happen is that you will be 150 calories less hungry over the next 24 hours than you would have been had you not eaten that peach, okay? So in the same way, you can imagine that if you try to cram water when you don't really want it, you're gonna be bored with it and you're not gonna be drinking very much water. And if, if you drink a bunch now, you'll be drinking less in the next hour after that. So this is how this works. Um, so this is all basically a huge explanation but the mind is not foolish and it is not actually, um, it's not designed by nature to make errors of this type and it wouldn't, okay? So you could overeat, but it would be overeating by calories, not by inherent volume of natural food. And so that's why AJ and I say, no junk in the house, because if you're bored, you're likely to eat, you're likely to systematically overeat on unnaturally rich food. So uh, do other species do the same? Uh, no. In other words, they're, they're, they're going to be just like humans. So they're, yeah, if you put super normal food out, they will overeat. They, uh, of course they will. And if you don't put super normal food out, they will naturally free feed to a point that optimate, uh, optimizes their biology. Now, in a very curious uh, finding that gets a lot of people excited and has had some people do some interesting and wacky things. And that is that if you'll systematically underfeed rats, for example, 
uh, they'll live a long time. So they can live, you know, 50% longer than they would normal lifespan. However, that, that has been touted as evidence that human beings should eat less than they want. Uh, and that this is, you know, this is going to be a really big deal with respect to increasing life expectancy. This is not true. And it turns out that the research on this has been not fully reported. In other words, that the average person who's heard this research doesn't know the whole story. So it's going to turn out that the only way that you can lengthen life of animals is to, to systematically underfeed them so that they never become uh, sexual adults. So they have to spend their entire lives effectively what, uh, what the biology of certain animals, not all, but what certain, uh, 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 typically of an animal life, if you will systematically feed the animal so that it can survive, but it cannot actually grow to adulthood, then, then that, that situation is a bizarre situation in nature where somehow it's slowing down the cellular reproductive process and uh, as a result, uh, the animal essentially is in a suspended animation and can live out a longer life and effectively somehow waiting for the biosynthetic machinery to kick in fully as it ever fully gets uh, fed and then it can can uh, blossom into an adult and then it be, can reproduce. So anybody, so of course, that little detail has been left out of a lot of people's thinking. So we've got several thousand people around the globe that have been systematically underfeeding themselves, thinking that they were going to live to 120. <laughs> okay. They're not. Okay. So they are not actually lengthening their lives at all. Uh, the glowing reports that you have seen out of these things, sometimes intermittent reports, uh, are, are actually, they, they don't look anything different than what would come out of the McDougal program. So it's going to turn out that these people that will systematically undereat, they will wind up with, you know, they won't have high blood pressure. They won't have, you know, diabetes. Well, of course they don't. They're, they're, they're not going to get, there's no way on earth they're going to get type 2 diabetes. They're, they're skin and bones, for goodness sakes. And so uh, they also have extremely low or non-existent libidos. No surprise. Essentially, essentially the body is sensing that we are in an environment of unbelievable deprivation and therefore there's no possible way the female could ever bring a child to term and if we brought it if we had a child it would starve to death because we're barely surviving ourselves so the genetic code is effectively um protecting the organism against wasting its energy uh trying to reproduce in such an environment and so the men basically have no sex drive at all okay so this is a bizarre way to try to live, to try to squeeze out, you know, well, people are trying to squeeze out another 20 or 30 years, but they're not going to squeeze out anything because they've already reached maturity. And so all that's going to happen is that extremely low calorie density vegan diets that are used for, for this kind of thing. Uh, what will they do? They will uh, foreclose you. They're, they're going to reduce your likelihood of winding up with some nasty disease just in the same way I'm a Google diet would. So there's going to be no advantage there. But uh, anyway, God knows how I got off of that on, on AJ. It, 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 I wandered off of it from the notion that you need to somehow monitor or systematically watch yourself when you're eating and be careful. And the answer is no, you don't. You have to be careful what you eat, not how much. Well, we've been shouting that for years and they're still arguing in the chat saying, yes, but it can't be oats because oats make you gain weight. They're never, you know, remember that gentleman that contacted us both at Rancho separately about like, well, no, you can't eat all the sweet potatoes you want. And he was proving to us that he gained weight eating sweet potatoes. Yeah. That If they don't believe it, they're never going to believe it. So yeah, yeah. Not yeah. We can and, do. and one of the reasons they don't is that they run extremely short-term experiments. Okay, so they'll they'll run a five day experiment and they'll eat potatoes and they'll gain two pounds, and they'll they'll jump up and down and point at that, and they don't understand that that's not that's not a, the scale is not monitoring fat changes on on a time scale like that 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 uh, only about a tenth of the variance that's involved in your weight from day to day. Or if your weight is one twenty three today and one twenty four tomorrow and one twenty two the next day and one twenty six two days from now. All the variance that you see in there has nothing to do with the fat stores. 
the, the fat stores on your body change incrementally, very, very slowly at the level of about an ounce a day, typically. Whereas your water weight and fecal material and glycogen stores can move the body weight around easily, you know, a couple of percent a day. And so when people run those experiments and they eat some potatoes and then they store a bunch of glycogen behind that, and behind that they store extra water and now they're up three pounds. Now they jump up and down and they say the potatoes make them fat. Okay, uh, it's understandable that they do it, do that, uh, but but they are not actually running the correct uh, experiment to, to to find out whether that's true for them. Yeah, I love that they run short term experience yeah. experiments, and that's the problem. So I put in the chat: Would anybody be interested in watching an eight hour dugathon? And would you pay a few pennies? And Beth wrote a hilarious comment. I know Dr. Goldhammer would laugh, and I think you will do. And she goes, "Sure, he'll get to four questions." Ah. <laughs> There you go. That's fair. They know you too well. That's right. Okay. So here I'm is thinking a, eight hours, maybe that may be too long, but three, okay. three hours. Think, yeah, we've done we've done three hours before actually yeah. in our classes. So that's sure. easy for you exactly. for sure. So Valerie says, I have a, I had a friend in high school that shared some hard stuff with me about her family life. I was no help whatsoever since I was a teenager and had no experience dealing with this kind of information. Now that I'm older, I'm remembering it all again. And I feel like I want to get in touch with her and at least say, I'm sorry, I couldn't be more help back then. I'm not sure if I should call her and bring it up or given that we've not spoken for years, maybe I should call her and not bring the stuff up. I don't think she really wants to talk to me. We're both in our fifties now. Yeah. Um, good question uh, about this. And so let's, uh, Let's understand that, that the ar architecture of mind is all about the present and the future. And so <clears throat> that when people have struggles in the past 30 years ago, they, they have transcended those struggles. They, they, are, now, they are now dealing with, uh, think, uh, I don't know, now, now, now my, now my uh, partner, Jen Hawk, you know, it's going to, you know, if she's listening to this, her hair will start to curl because I'm going to use a sports analogy. Sports analogy is, let's suppose you are a football coach and you've been coaching for 25 years. And in year three, you had a championship level team and, you know, you made a decision and you, you, you know, laid in an important game and you lost the game or you know, your star player made a mistake or whatever. And at the time, it was pretty upsetting. And everybody's disappointed and everybody, you know, the kids are crying up there on the stand when the press is interviewing them. And, you know, it's a big deal. And it is a disappointment. But next spring, you know, if the next you know, or ball practice starts and you feel the excitement of the new opportunity. And now you have a new adventure with the next group and you go through it again. And maybe that quarterback's still there and, you know, he's got a chance for redemption. Now, all of that is true, and it's very important. It is your life at that point, and it's it's the immersive, important, you know, agendas of your existence at that time. So it's very important. However, now we fast forward twenty five years. So you were a thirty seven year old coach at the time. Now we're sixty two, and you've had twenty five different classes of young athletes through there, and you have a million memories. And you have other championship games and you've had other things that happen. And now when we sit down and talk to you, the how important do you think that that, that team from you know, 1992 is at this moment to you? It's an interesting memory. And you'll have fond memories and you'll have some frustration as you replay the errors that you made and lessons that you learned. But it is not dominating your existence today at all. What's dominating your existence today is that your star quarterback, you know, has an ankle sprain and you got a big game on Saturday. In other words, your life is, of course, immersed in the present and the immediate future. It has to be. OK, you, you're you're the, the entire purpose of your memory is not to handicap you from bad things that happened in the past. The, it's, uh, the, memory, the entire purpose of the memory is to improve your ability to make good decisions in the present. That's what it's for. If that, if that were not what it was for, 
then it would have not worked as an evolutionary tool, okay? Your teeth are here for a reason. Uh, they're in here to help you survive. That is the purpose of them. Your fingers are here for a reason. So are your memories. Your memories are here for a reason. And if, if bad memories cause dysfunction uh, in the system, then the system would simply not have them, okay? So your friend, with whatever troubles she had in her childhood, you know, 50 years ago, those are, you know, if we were to talk about those things, they would call up unpleasant files. But those unpleasant files are not active. In other words, people, people have the notion that if I can call up a memory and I can start crying and be upset about it, it must mean that it's deep in me and it's, it's like termites eating away at my satisfaction today because after all, it's in there because we activate it with memory. No, 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 that's a mistake. That's a huge catastrophic error in understanding human psychology. It's not affecting me at all, okay? It has no effect. So it will only have effects on my present, you know, if, it, if the file is called up and the file is only gonna be called up if it's relevant to the current situation. So if I go into dynamic therapy and the, the, the lady starts asking me all about it, it's going to call it up because she's calling it up, okay? But otherwise, it's ineffectual. These are non -ex they're, they're files that are quiet. They're utterly quiescent. Okay, so I have all kinds of things I've cried about, all kinds of things I've been upset or twisted. I, I could start calling them up right now. One movie after the next, I'll start tearing up about field of dreams. Okay? That's not because I've got some repressed thing about the afterlife and James Earl Jones and Kevin Costner's beautiful voice and, you know, and the whole story and the kid with the hot dog. It's like, no, they, they, that's not influencing my life today, but it's a file. Okay. So this is, this is a, it's essentially, there can be an incredible book in the library. And you read that book 20 years ago and it's engrossing and fantastic. It's Samuel Shellabarger, The Prince of Foxes. Okay. It's an incredible story. Now, and I've read it. I've read it more than once. <laughs> if I read it, it can bring me to tears. It's and it's so exciting and an amazing story. They made a movie out of it, okay, 40 years ago. The um, but the point is, is that that book is in the library, it's sitting there, or it's sitting on my shelf up there. I don't when I walk by it, it doesn't even cause any emotional response. Okay, why? It's it's deep in a memory structure and it's not having any, any influence at all. Okay, that's how memory works. Memory works as a filing system to call up when data is needed from the past. And if you notice, a lot of data that's in there that gets flagged is either very important losses, quote traumas, or traumatic things that are very negative. That, those are flagged, of course they're flagged. They, they have to you, they have to be ready to be called up in case something in the present is associated with it because we experience some losses. But they almost are never called up. Okay, so they're only called up under the very narrow set of circumstances that where it would be useful to call it up. And the same thing is true of great victories and, and wonderful things that have happened. So wonderful things. I don't think back of all the wonderful things that have happened in my life either. I'm not repressing those. The, the, the truth is, is that they are relevant when it when decisions in the present are like, gee, what could I do that I really, really enjoyed doing? Where would I really like to go and who would I like to hang out with? Well, let me consult my memory and see whether or not there's any possibilities here that I'm not considering, that I have, you know, that I have not, that are not in my immediate uh, awareness. Let me call up files and think about it. Okay. So when I call up files to think about where to go on vacation, I think about the British Virgin Islands. I think about the Mexican coast. I think about Hawaii. Um, I don't think too much about Europe. I've been there a few times, but I'm not particularly enamored with it. Uh, I'd like to go to beaches and, you know, stay out in the sun on the beach for about eight minutes till I start to get sunburned. Then I hide under an umbrella because I'm you know, light skin. 
But the point is, is that I love the look of that clear blue, clear blue water, and I like to go out on it if it's warm enough and it's pretty and I like the breeze. So these are all these little memory circuits that will get consulted when I start to think about uh, other places that I might like to be. So your friend had some unpleasant experiences and 50 years ago, she wanted you to talk about it because she was attempting to get advice and perspective and calibration at the time. And you couldn't really assist her because you weren't knowledgeable enough about how on earth one would solve those, those dilemmas. Fair enough, they're done, okay? So I would suggest that you contact and say hello to your friend if that friend feels like she's a really useful, interesting person that is somehow there's cost benefit in you for both. But don't be trying to wheedle your way in there in order to deal with a hyper-conscientious open loop about how you didn't help her in her time of need. And now you'll go back and you know excavate and we'll talk about that and so that you can essentially uh, com complete your own feeling of responsibility. No, you have no such responsibility and there's no such profit in it and it's not useful and it's, you know, won't be particularly harmful, but wouldn't be pleasant uh, to do the whole thing. There's just no reason for it. There's all, all kinds of unpleasant things that happen in my life that I have no reason to go back and revisit those. And I'm not avoiding them. They're just, it's not profitable. It's not useful. And there's no reason to do it. Okay. So that's, that's how I would look at that. And I e say hello, uh, if it makes sense for fun in the present. And if it doesn't, forget it. Okay. Well, thanks. I'm sure she appreciates that. I can see that she's watching live. All right. So the next question, you, you've answered this once uh, uh, about this. It's about withholding grandchildren, but this is more than that. It, it's about maybe how to deal with these type of disagreeable people. And Joanne writes, Dr. Lyle, our daughter displays what we would best describe as classic passive aggressive behavior. Behind the scenes, she lies, manipulates, and deflects. To our faces, she denies and ducks. We know we can't change her. The issue is in trying to maintain a relationship with our seven and nine-year-old grandchildren who really want to be with us, and they don't want to leave when we see them. Last time, it was planned to have them stay a few days, and with 10 minutes notice, the visit was canceled because the mother said, I'll miss them too much. The parents are angry and jealous. What is best to do? I hear that a lot. People using their grandchildren as a pawn in- The parents were angry and jealous that I'm confused, AJ. Um, so it's, it's sounding like the parents of the grandchildren are angry and jealous, maybe that the grandchildren want to be with the grandparents. Wait, wait, I, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting, let me see if I understand this. Okay. The- um, so our writer is a grandparent. Yes. That grandparent has a ch child who's an adult woman. Yes, who seems to be very disagreeable. She says passive aggressive, manipulates. Right, passive aggressive. And the, the, the parents here, the grandparents want to get access to the grandkids and the grandkids enjoy interacting with their grandparents. But the, the, uh, the adult child who is the mother of these children basically is a pain in the ass. Okay. Yes, disagreeable. Right. Yes, Got for it. sure. Okay, so now all that you can do is that you can essentially be trying to discern under what conditions, um, under what conditions that she would grant you access to the grandchildren. So, in other words, you're all that you're you are um, you are completely out of control with respect to her decision making. So all that you can do is attempt to influencing it to influence it by making her offers that are attractive to her. That's all. That's all you can do. So um, that uh, so uh, so there there would be there would be potential potential mistakes in the negotiating process that a, a person could make. For example, you could show that you're irritated with her, at which point you're signaling to her that she's being unfair but from her perspective she's a dictator so you're talking to joseph stalin here joseph stalin and you're saying well but the grandkids really like staying with us as if they have any rights in this which they don't okay so the grandchildren's preferences are not relevant the only thing that is relevant is the personal individual psychology and agendas of your daughter okay 
So if she's manipulative and passive aggressive, that means that you are putting some pressure on her that she's reacting to by not being straight with you about what her preferences are and what she wants, which means that understandably you have felt like you have some kind of rights that you feel like it is quote reasonable and therefore you felt irritated when your goals have been blocked and you signal that and then you get passive aggressive behavior, okay? So there's something about, in other words, you feel like the, the value that you, you're, you're basically thinking, well, I bring, bring value to your grandchildren. You should be interested in that. And therefore, this is, should be a win-win, but it isn't necessarily a win-win to her. You have to understand that in her psychology, there's a lot of grandparents out there, by the way, that try to steal those children. That this is not, I'm not saying that this person has one neuron in there that's going that direction. But what I'm saying is, is that we have to understand that that is a legitimate motivational pattern that you will see in human life. It's not uncommon at all. There's all kinds of grandparents that are suing and otherwise trying to put pressure and put financial pressure, try to big, big time inducements, threatening to exit people from the will. There is a lot of pressure that grandparents feel feverishly uh, determined to get access to grandchildren. Okay, understood. In other words, these are their gene vessels and they feel like, gee, I only want the best for them. I will pour resources into them. How can you refuse those resources? And the answer is, because I'm their parent. Okay, so you're, you don't, you have to keep in mind that your child, depending upon how their, their motivational system is constructed, their personality and their situation, they may feel threatened by your relationship with your grandchildren. Okay, so you might say, well, that's neurotic and crazy and needs psychoanalysis and needs to be changed. It's not going to be changed. It doesn't matter why that is the situation. If that's the situation, that's the situation. So the, the correct motivational scheme is to make that person an offer they can't easily refuse. Now, the truth is they could refuse all offers, but your job is to try to figure out, you know, what is it that they would most want from me? Under what circumstances would they grant me access to my grandchildren? Okay. And if those were the circumstances, are those amenable to me? And you might say, you know what? Under those conditions, I'm not interested. Fair enough. Then we don't have a trade. Okay. So in some ways, this is kind of like a girl telling a guy and the guy saying, hey, well, I, I, can I take you out? Hmm, where are you going to take me? Well, I could take you to such and such. No, thank you. Well, what if I took you here? No, thank you. Well, wh where could I take you? Oh, what if you took me, you could take me on a trip to the Taj Mahal in India and, you know, pay, pay for everything. We'd have separate rooms and blah, blah, blah. And the guy's like, well, forget it. I'm not going to do that. Fair enough. Okay. She's, she doesn't have to, she can pitch what it is that would be, be uh, uh, sufficiently valuable to her and under what conditions. And then if you don't like those conditions, oh, well, then there's no deal. There's no tragedy if there's no deal. There's just no deal. Okay. So this is, uh, uh, this is how it is that I would look at this problem. So your, your daughter is your daughter. Her agendas are her agendas. If she's being passive aggressive, that's because she feels like she's trying to get some resources out of you, but you're not wanting to give those resources under the conditions that she's willing to trade. So your job is to be essentially to, to essentially reconstruct uh, your understanding of what your actual position is. No rights, okay? No rights at all. She's a dictator and that you are essentially, all, all that you get to do is you get to pitch her an offer that she may not refuse. That's it, okay? And uh, if you wrap your head around that that's what the situation is, that those children have absolutely no rights and you have absolutely no rights, okay? So uh, there are states where that isn't true. You can actually sue and get access to a certain hours a month of, you know, monitored interaction or something like that. There, and there's people that do that. 
And my attitude is, wow, what a total waste of time. You know, you're, you're, the only reasonable way to, to interact here is to pitch, try to find out basically under what, you know, what, what would is that your ideal situation be at some point for us interacting with our grandchildren? Okay. What would, what would work best for you? And that's it. That, that's the question. That's the attitude. And we take what we can get and uh, what we are willing to give under those circumstances. And otherwise, we're, you recognize that you are out of control. And that's that. That's all there is to it. It seems like all the problems in the world are caused by disagreeable people. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they, they are responsible for the overwhelming majority of civil litigation, and they are certainly uh, responsible for the overwhelming majority of criminal uh, action. In other words, disagreeable, you're, you're absolutely right, AJ, uh, disagreeable people are, are the root of a hu huge percentage of human uh, strife. Can we, can we just get rid of them? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not quite that simple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this question is from Marlena, and she says, could you please ask Dr. Lyle what he thinks of hypnosis? Her psych My psych professor was a hypnotherapist, and he swears by the powerful effects it has to help people overcome problems in their minds and in their lives. Um. I've actually never seen any evidence that hypnosis was useful for anything. Now, let me explain that there's a caveat there. That um, hypnosis is a uh, is going to be an experience that someone's going to have, and that experience, uh, all experiences of any kind, are going to. Uh, be slightly altering the cost-benefit analytics that take place in the person's mind. So let me give you an example. So let's let's suppose that you told me, hey, listen, a friend of mine um, actually has, you know, he has a brother. And his brother's an electronics genius, and he's actually figured out this new gizmo, and it's going to make. Um, you know, getting like cable TV and stuff a lot cheaper. Like the way all the costs now with the way they are, this is going to be a revolution in this thing. It's going to cut everybody's cable bills around the world by like 75%. And this is what this guy did. And he, he worked at Stanford in this fancy lab. And, you know, he, he did his PhD thesis on this. And anyway, he's figured this out. And he's got some capital money. And, and you know, they're looking, to, they're trying to keep the whole thing in house. To the family, but if you, you know, you pony up like ten thousand dollars, this could go hundred to one to make a million dollars off this. Okay, all right. What's that sound like? You got my attention. <laughs> okay, so what am I going to do before I write a check for ten thousand dollars? I'm going to do some checking and I'm going to see whether it's logical. Okay, now you can notice the difference between myself and somebody else. So I know of somebody that that had that there was a scheme about like this, and they ponied up a huge amount of money. In other words, I, I'm thinking of two doctors that I know. Doctor number one uh, ponied up a huge amount of money, put a lot of money into a scheme like this. Doctor number two was told about this by doctor number one. Okay, <clears throat> doctor number two is inherently far more cautious. If you looked at their two careers, it's obvious. So doctor number two is extremely cautious and as a result and skeptical as hell about everything. And it looked so good that doctor number two ponied up a grand sum of $8,000 of, of a very large pile of cash that could have been put in. And doctor number two sat back at this and about a year later, it was found out that the entire thing was an extraordinarily elaborate fraud. Okay. So doctor number one lost a fortune. Doctor number two lost $8,000 and considered it kind of an entertaining lesson. Now, so what's the lesson from here? Well, watch how the two of them were both motivated, but they were motivated differently. 
they took different amount of risks, et cetera. If you were hypnotized and you are told this and that about it, that the effects that it's going to have, they that could work in the sense that it might motivate you to take some actions that are themselves effective and it, it, it may change somebody's life. I've met a bunch of people who said, oh yeah, I did hypnosis, I stopped smoking. Yeah, except there's a problem. And that is that if we do a random assignment condition on stopping smoking and hyp hypnosis, we don't find any effect over placebo. Okay, so, so it's like, okay, well, so now what does that say? Did that say that the hypnosis didn't work? For that individual, well, I'm not sure that we could say that because quote, what the hypnosis process was, was a complicated process that motivated that individual because they believed that if they would do X, Y, Z, they would get some results. And when they did some things, some things happened. So in other words, I think that hypnosis can work to basically rock people out of their, uh, maybe a stasis that they are in and cause them to start changing their behavior in a way that winds up then it may get them on a path to being uh, doing something that's effective and then it basically snowballs and they have su success in whatever it is. That would be true for weight loss, okay? So uh, weight loss, somebody could say, oh, well, I went to hypnosis and I did this and I did that and boy, that turned my life around. And I've had people that'll swear to that. Uh, I, uh, I had a, um, uh, I, I witnessed a conversation. <laughs> with uh, uh, Dr. Martin Orn. So Dr. Martin Orn was, uh, was one of the, the most decorated uh, people in the history of hypnosis. There's a few in there that are giants. Uh, Milton Erickson is another one. And uh, but Dr. Martin Orn was a, both a psychiatrist and a psychologist, and he was a professor at uh, the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. And he was a worldwide authority in, in hypnosis. And Martin Orn was about 400 pounds. And um, I actually told uh, my brother-in-law to contact Martin Orn in, in a, in a uh, major civil case where my brother-in-law was representing a plaintiff who was being sued by somebody that said that, that uh, the, 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 the defendant was actually a psychiatrist. And they were being accused of having used hypnosis to try to fleece somebody. And uh, Dr. Martin and I said, my brother-in-law called me and said, hey, I need an expert witness in hypnosis. Do you know of anybody? And I said, yes, I do, Dr. Martin Orn. And so they called in Martin Orn at a, at a rather hefty fee. And Martin Orn exploded that case. And, uh, at the dinner afterwards, uh, my brother-in-law's mother, who had a weight problem, asked Dr. Orn and said, gee, hypnosis, will that work for weight? And Dr. Orn looks down at his enormous stomach and says, no. <laughs> so that is the story. And so if you personally have succeeded in weight loss or stopping smoking or something else from hypnosis, uh, I don't. I don't want to say that it didn't work because something about that process worked. But if we were to use, if we were to say, is it the process itself as it's being described, et cetera, is, it, is what it's working? The answer is no. Okay. And we would be able to tell that uh, by, you know, we could go on and say, well, some people are hypnotizable and some people aren't. And therefore, in you know, random assignment and condition, but that shouldn't work that way. Because if you have, and no treatment control versus a treatment control, then if you've got some people that would be treatable through the hypnotic process, they should succeed and they would drag up the average of your group relative to the one that gets an inner treatment. So yeah, that's the story. Uh, that's, that's my last, I haven't read anything in 20 years on hypnosis, so I'm not quote up on it. Maybe somebody is, has got some interesting demonstrations that are, that are compelling. But uh, at that time, uh, out of the horse's mouth, uh, there are uses for hypnosis. I think hypnosis can put people in this sort of uh, endorphin-like state that can be super useful for pain management. Okay, so there are there there are uh, that that is one of the great uses for the hypnotic state is for that. But for major behavior change on things that you're struggling with, 
Yeah, I, I don't think so. That is so funny that you said that because Cheryl just posted hypnosis helped me with pain management. However, it does not work for everyone. It needs to be a well-qualified professional. And then another uh, viewer, Marley says, it didn't work for me for pain and depression. I want to tell you my experience with it. So uh, it's just like you say, I found it extremely relaxing, kind of like restorative yoga. I did it for my fear of flying yeah. and it, it did seem to help me. Uh, um, you know, yeah. maybe just because I'm very suggestible, but but the, the practitioner had just her name is Lisa Hubler. She's been on the show. Her voice is just it, it just it did seem to help me, you know, a lot. Um, and that's what I went to her for. And she has also I've sent people to her that have been in my program that absolutely hate eating healthy. And, mm-hmm. and, and she has helped them, encouraging them to eat more fruits or vegetables through her work. So I guess maybe it depends on the practitioner, the individual. Yeah. Uh, but, but I found it to be a very pleasant and powerful experience. And I would definitely do it again. Yeah, no, I, I can see all kinds of elements of the quote hypnosis process that would be effective. Um, the, the essentially components of the underlying theory, which is that somehow we're going to bypass your conscious mind and talk to the unconscious and then we're going to convince it of something, et cetera. These are now bogus ideas. Okay. So the, the mechanics of how it would help the way they're described, et cetera, that's not going to fly, but in, in, but elements of the process, I can absolutely see that they would be elements of a lot of processes, including, for example, uh, re- a highly relaxed state. So yeah, it's the hypnosis as it's conceived, I think is a, is you know it is not working in the way anybody thinks it works. That's what I would say. Yeah. All you, right. Do you remember Pat Collins, the hip hypnotist? Yes, I remember. I used to go to her show when I lived in LA. It was really entertaining. And I always wondered if it was real. Right. I don't even know what to say about it. Uh, the more they look at it, they don't even know what hypnotic state is. It's like, yeah, yeah they, they, they can look at the brain theoretically and hypnosis. It's like, I don't know. There's nothing special or fancy happening there. So I, you know, what, what, what can we say? Another the next 50 years of investigation into that might uncover some quirky, interesting things that we have not yet fully identified. Yeah. Let's try hypnotizing the people in unclean environments to not, you know, let's see if that works. We'll do a double blind random, whatever they call it, randomized control. Yeah, they're, they're randomized control. You got yeah, it. Okay. Uh, do you have time for one more question? I sure do. You okay. got it. This sounds like something I could have sworn I heard this on Beat Your Jeans, but it's possible that the person had the same situation. It's from Renata. And she says, I'm a 32-year-old female. I dropped out of medical school in the second year, three years ago, to extreme stress, anxiety, panic attacks, and just a general state of unhappiness. Since then, I've been living with my parents. I'm very disappointed in myself and don't know what to do to move forward. I feel like a complete failure as both my undergraduate and graduate degrees, bachelor's and master's in biochemistry, were completed with the goal of going to medical school. Now that I've exhausted that idea, I don't know what to do. Since then, I've been accepted to several other healthcare-related graduate programs, but I freaked out in the last minute and didn't attend anything. I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid to go to school, work, even leave my house. I feel like I'm paralyzed by my own fear of failure. I'm constantly stressed. How can I over... Oh, gosh. I'd like to remain anonymous. Don't say that on the last line. I keep, oh my God. I mean, this is crazy. I'm so sorry, but you have, I said that at the beginning, you got to say anonymous at the beginning. So sorry about that. I only said the first name. No worries. I apologize. um, Yeah. In other words, so this is a, this is a young person who is, is now uh, confused. In other words, she's got a very complicated life. In other words, so the, the cost benefit uh, trying to figure out what direction to go. She, she's obviously extremely bright, highly conscientious, uh, and very accomplished. So, in other words, she's she's basically built, you know, three quarters of a of a beautiful stone wall around her property, but she hasn't built the fourth wall, and she's not sure what it should look like and what the, where the gate should be. So, she's got a lot of uncertainty there, and she's not basically sure how to best utilize uh, her time and energy. So, you're a little lost. And, um, and you, this is a, uh, this, this is a part of the, uh, I, I, I look at the solutions to, to these problems through what I call the village template, 
So I look and see whether or not this problem exists in the Stone Age. And if it doesn't exist in the Stone Age, then I know that it's a problem of the modern environment. So uh, by the way, this is, we talk about things like this and try to explore some of these concepts uh, in a seminar series that Jen Hawk and I do a few times a year now. And we're going to do another one uh, in towards the end of May. It's called, uh, you can find it under truetolife.us. Um, it's 1995 to get the, the live stream of our, of, our, uh, of our whole afternoon seminar, morning and afternoon seminar. It's all, they're on Sundays. And uh, if you want to come, then uh, there's a few, you know, there's spots for some people there. It's in, it's in the Washington, D.C. area. We've got uh, 25 people that have signed up and we'll probably have another 10 or 15 to sign up between now and the next several weeks. We'd love to see you. At any rate, in any event, the, um, the, the village template, that is, that is the, that winds up sort of being the, what finally I lay on top of the problems of human life in, in the book Jen and I are writing, as we explain all these things, a lot of that you heard today about the nature of how the mind works and its uh, and its motivational architecture, how it all goes, then we finally come down to okay, that's all very interesting, but how do we solve the problems that someone's having? Well, here's a young person with a problem, and the first thing we look at is we say, "Huh, does this problem exist in the Stone Age?" And the answer is no. No, it doesn't. There's no, there's no person in the Stone Age that says, oh my God, I worked really hard at this and then I didn't, you know, I couldn't handle the stress there. So what am I going to do now? It's like, well, what you're going to do now is you're going to get your, get your little shovel together and you're going to start digging potatoes like everybody else. Because if you don't do that, you're going to starve to death. Okay. So in other words, you don't have a choice. You must be productive or you're going to be hungry, tired, cold, and in the, in the eyes of a predator going to have to be useful to the village. So it means that your problems are being exacerbated by the fact that you're living with your parents under their roof on their finances and that you are not facing the cold, hard world of being a barista at Starbucks. <laughs> now, so what is the right move? Okay. Well, I'm not exactly sure what the right move would be that would make the most sense for you, but that you can, uh, you can, Believe me that if you spoke with me or with Dr. Jen Hawk, if you got a consult with us, you would find out that we would be using the village template. We would be thinking, okay, uh, what's missing from your life is esteem signals from other people that you are doing something productive for them. If you don't have that, you are missing an incredible, it's like not having sunshine. Okay, It's like not having food or not having a good night's sleep. You are, you are missing, uh, your, your life is distorted uh, and it is not, doesn't have the elements that cause human security and happiness and excitement, okay? So sometimes what we have to do is we have to find ways to restore the Stone Age environment, the, the elements of the Stone Age environment that are out of balance. So that's why we have people go to True North. That's a place where they can go and essentially recapture a Stone Age environment around diet. Everybody that's around is eating whole natural food. You're not having to try to eat healthy food when everybody else is eating pepperoni pizza. Okay, so no, you're immersed in an environment that is going after this critical element of how it is that you know you need to restore a Stone Age feature in order for your body to get healthy. If you can't go to Tronor, go to, you know, you need to fast at home and you need it to be not as a elaborate and expensive a process as flying to California, then look up Nathan Gersfeld at fastingestate.com and get his advice and instruction on how to do it at home. In the same way, you now bring into your home, you restore the Stone Age elements of your environment so that your body can get back to its Stone Age level functioning, which is higher than an indulged body in a modern environment. Same principle, okay? So the um, so this young person's environment is out of balance. Uh, it's out of balance. You are being mollycoddled, okay, uh, by extremely well-meaning people, and uh, you are you are, have a rich riches of choice. So you you are you are therefore paralyzed because you can't decide which one is the, the the right one, and you've got a nervous system that effectively is um, uh, can't can't actually figure out 
how to analyze this thing properly and start to take some forward action. So uh, without a consultation, I would tell you that a, I don't know what your financial circumstances are, what you can afford to do, but a perfectly reasonable thing to do is to look at the least possible investment that you can make in any kind of a pro professional process, which may be for you, for example, getting a job in some medical related industry right now, even if you don't like the job, and even though it wouldn't be a terminal job and it's not the job you were seeking, if you thought you might be interested in X arena, go live in it for a while and work in it for a while. You can always pull yourself out and then go get the MD, PhD, or whatever the heck it is that you need to do in order to do it. So if you're interested in molecular genetics, then go find some way to work in molecular genetics and have somebody pay you a clerk salary of $18 an hour to enter data. And you'll be in and around those people and that industry and seeing what they're doing. And then you could decide whether or not, hey, I really want to do that. And I've got the chops to do more. Fine. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to to say, well, I think maybe I could be a, a genetic counselor. That's a new thing in the world. And so you've certainly got the, the brains and the record for it. So the um, then you can apply to genetic counselor programs and uh, and to and to become a genetic counselor. And you're like, well, after two years, I didn't want to do that. And I don't really want to do it. And, you know, uh, I, I'm going to drop out halfway in. Fine, drop out halfway in. What do we care? Do something. OK, but but the inaction of not knowing what to do and not being forced to do it. OK, this is you are this is a sophisticated version of what I call an animal in the zoo. So <clears throat> when we've got some 20 year old young man that's playing video games all day and he seems depressed and his mom is all worried about him and he isn't going to school, but he's thinking about maybe going back in the fall to the JC and taking a class. And mom's like, what are we going to do? We can't ask him to do anything. He can't get a job. He's too shy and too anxious. It's like, oh, yes, he can. Oh, yes, he can get a job. And he's not too shy and too anxious. He's being mollycoddled. He's an animal in a zoo. And uh, if we kick him out and show him the door, suddenly he's going to have to get super confident really fast. <laughs> so, the, it, it, a miraculous motivational system gets tripped as soon as we're actually facing poverty and hunger, okay? And this may seem, sound crude and ruthless, but the truth of the matter is, folks, that's how 100% of all of your ancient ancestors survived every day of their life. They had poverty and hunger at the door every day. There wasn't a door, it was wide open. So if you can imagine that that's how all humans survived for a million years, then your kid can certainly face the possibility of that for in a discussion around the kitchen table, okay? And so uh, this is, uh, what's happening here is, uh, this is a sophisticated version of an animal in a zoo. This person has a great deal of motivation and push and capability, but they're frozen up. But they're frozen up because they don't have to make a decision, okay? And uh, so finding a way to rock that system into making a decision. And that's the way we get increased information in order to run better parameter estimates on CVs for your life. So right now you will you will potentially spin in this state indefinitely until we make a change. So uh, the great motivational lecturer, Jim Rohn, who's a great favorite of both AJ's and I, uh, one of the things he said is, you know, somebody's just sitting on the fence, he can't know, can't know which way, you know, should I go here? Should I go there? I don't know what to do. And Ron says, you know, just get off. <laughs> just get off the fence. If you find out you're in the wrong place, then you know you're in the wrong place. Go get some new information uh, by changing up your circumstances. That's what we would have you do. Great. Thanks, Dr. Lyle. I just saw a great question, but we'll save it for next time. We'll with me, right. be the first one. Thank you. This was wonderful, Dr. Lyle. A pleasure, AJ. You say hi anytime, any reason. Absolutely. We got to think about that marathon. I think it would be really great. Gotcha. All right. Thanks, all right. Bye, folks. Thanks, Dr. Lyle. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for Kathy Hester's Kitchen. She'll be making gluten-free and vegan matzo ball soup in 